Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the Platonic computer. And my guest, Simon Duan, is the originator of that concept. He came from China to the United Kingdom in the 1980s to study, and he received a doctoral degree in materials science from Cambridge University. He is a past vice president of the Chinese Parapsychology Association, and he is founder and CEO of Metacomputics Labs, researching a post-materialist paradigm that unifies consciousness, mind, and matter. Simon is based in the UK, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Simon. It's very nice to be with you once again. Great to be with you again. And today, we're going to talk about your theory. I, I want to also make sure that our viewers have had a chance to watch the previous video. So, I'm going to link to it for people who have computers that can get a hot link on a YouTube video. It'll be in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And uh, the reason I think it's important is because you are deeply imbued with a wide range of phenomena that we would consider uh, of high strangeness. Uh, but I think maybe they're even more common in China than they are in, in the United States. And what you have endeavored to do is to find a theoretical model that can account for this. There are so much resources in China. Last time we covered not only the history, but the present day. There's so many phenomena. I like your words to describe it called high strangeness. They are really strange. You also suggest many people refuse to believe them. But I encounter them personally. So I'm convinced this happens. Therefore, I have been trying to figure out how this could happen. So this is actually the driving force for me to develop a theory to find the explanation for this. And so my research into a uh, psi uh, has two parts. First part is fascination and bewilderment because there's so many things which I couldn't explain, which bothers me. This uh, drives me to develop uh, a model to explain those phenomena. And after I developed this model, my continuing ex uh, exploration of psi, it becomes combination of fascination and clarity. So everything becomes so clear, actually, so easy to understand if we incorporate the uh, simulation hypothesis. For example, if the universe is a processing output of computation, then if you can change the program, output will change. If you can change the physical property, you can bend metals. So solid become malleable. If you can change the location data of an object, then teleportation can happen. You, you just change the coordinates, three X, Y, Z coordinates, and then this object can be uh, another place straight away. Physics basically is a set of program, set of rules. But if you can change it, alter it, or suspend it temporarily, uh, for example, if you can suspend gravity temporarily, then levitation can happen. So everything becomes so easy to explain if you incorporate a, a computation into the framework of reality. So this has been the base uh, for my model. It would be fair to say that your platonic computer model is 
one of several models in the category of, of the larger category of simulation theories. That's correct. Actually, the first person who proposed this uh, speculation is a German computer scientist. His, his name is Rose, and he developed the first programmable computer in the 40s. In 1969, he first proposed hypothesis that the, the whole universe could be a, a output of computer computation. And, uh, in the 90s, John Wheeler proposed a now very famous phrase called "it from bit." Everything physical have information behind it, so "it from bit." So those are the pioneers. And more recently, uh, Nick Boston. Uh, from Oxford University, he pushed the idea to to a very large audience. He he's thinking in the same way as Elon Musk. Actually, Musk also believes because the computation technology has developed so fast. If you extrapolate this, then you can imagine the future civilizations can have advanced technology which can produce simulations. Which is hard to distinguish from a physical reality. Therefore,、uh, there's a chance that this uh, present uh, physical world is the simulation from the advanced、uh, civilization. They simulate the ancestors. So this is a very popular、uh, hypothesis at the moment. But I think because the mainstream、uh, academia, the Are basically confined themselves in material world. They only sort of speculate like horizontally into the future. Yeah, the future civilization、uh, simulate the present civilization.、Uh, so it's a physical simulation basically. They don't really go beyond physical. It's like <laughs> to me, it's it's almost like a allegory cave. So they are confined. They are not allowed, even to think beyond physical. Whereas I think, if you go beyond the physical, you can hypothesize a transcendental computer. That's another level of reality beyond the physical. If it's transcendental, I need to locate it somewhere. So it seems the only sensible place inverted comma. Where I can locate this computer is the realm of forms proposed by Plato. That's why I propose there might be a, a Platonic computer、uh, in the Platonic、oh. realm, which is responsible for the output of this physical reality. In other words. If I understand you correctly, you would suggest that the the thinking of、uh, the computer scientists and philosophers like Bostrom, and also I've done two interviews with Rizwan Virk. He has two books out about the simulation hypothesis and. The idea that we actually live inside of a computer, a massive computer built by a very advanced alien civilization, you sort of look at that as a metaphor for what's actually happening. Yeah,、um, but we we do rely on metaphors、uh, to to model reality. I mean, that's what we do as scientists.、Uh, we model the reality using metaphors. For example, in mechanics time, our advanced technology is clocks and watches. So we model the universe as a clock-like machine. Newton's mechanics model is basically a set of equations to describe the macro objects, a movement of a macro object. What when society and、uh, industry were electrified, we had a new concept: electricity. So we started to model the micro universe in terms of electrically charged particles. So that led to the、uh, development of the atomic model and、uh, the standard model uh, of uh, subatomic particles. We rely on metaphors to、uh, to build the models.
Uh, nowadays, we are in information age. We have new concept metaphors available to us, such as computer simulation, uh, virtual reality. And unsurprisingly, uh, those concepts give us new metaphors. So we can build new model of reality. I think in the information age, the computer simulation metaphor uh, is the right metaphor. We can develop new models of the reality. So a platonic computer would exist outside of uh, time and space as it's normally understood in, in an eternal realm. Uh, I think Plato described uh, the realm of forms as, as being perfect and, and eternal. Then it, it sort of begs the question, though, of uh, since the, the, the Platonic forms are geometric and they're, one, one can understand them in terms of Euclidean geometry, which was popular in, in, in Plato's era, how would a computer fit into a Platonic realm? Well, uh, platonic realm accommodate uh, all sorts of things, uh, not only geometry shapes. Perfect geometry shapes is one of the things uh, accommodated in, in platonic realm. You also have numbers. You also have abstract concepts. Uh, those are all accommodated in a platonic realm. So um, by placing numbers in a platonic realm, the physics actually have, have a sort of a more solid uh, foundation because the physics is built uh, upon mathematics, whereas mathematics is built upon numbers. So platonic realm is actually very fundamental. According to Plato, abstract entities are more real. The, the physical reality is only a shadow or poor imitation of the realm of forms. So applying this principle, uh, we can hypothesis that because we have a physical computer made of silicon, there ought to be a, a abstract computer in the platonic realm. Um, the platonic computer is, is more fundamental, it's more real, it's more powerful, whereas the physical computer is only a poor imitation of the platonic computer. By manipulating the physical computer to produce the virtual reality, we can model how platonic computer produce the physical reality. Now, I understand that Plato would also suggest that in this platonic realm are these ideals of truth, beauty, and goodness, and also Probably most important in Plato's writings, if I understand them correctly, is the idea that uh, he refers to as the one, mm. the single essence that I guess you might say is the source of everything that's manifest. <laughs> okay. So Platonic realm, I, I think, has uh, also uh, levels of reality, and you have universals. And then that universals can be reduced further uh, to one eventually. So uh, <laughs> in the model I'm building, platonic realm actually uh, has many levels. In the platonic realm, I located this computer. Uh, this computer has a three components. One is the processor, uh, which is made from a binary switch. Uh, for those viewers who are not familiar with computer, actually computation is actually very simple. To compute is actually to answer a binary questions. Uh, yes or no. To be or not to be. Zero or one. So it's only uh, two states. Computer is basically a batch of switches, uh, which can be one of the two states. So you have a processor made of uh, a binary uh, switch. Uh, you have a database, which is composed of strings of binary opposites. Yes or no, yes or no. Yeah. So those can be a database. 
Uh, another component of the platonic computation is the program. In machine language, the program is also a binary. Yeah, it's written by zeros, ones, yeah, yes and nos. So platonic computer basically have those three components. You have a processor, you have a data, you have a program. And those three components can be further reduced to abstract binary because what's common in those three are basically binaries. Binary to be or not to be, yes or no, basically. Every computer uh, has a, a programmer and a designer. How does that fit in? You, uh, you reduce this uh, computer to a binary, abstract the binary. I define the binary as manifested consciousness, one side. The unmanifested matter consciousness is the other side. It's a binary. I've done a few interviews with a religious philosopher, a traditionalist philosopher, Charles Upton, uh, who writes about the perennial philosophy. And he points out that in all of the great metaphysical traditions of every single culture, this is a common theme, the idea of the manifest God and the unmanifest God. So, so you're, you are hitting upon uh, a, a notion which is really quite universal. Yes, I agree. So, a uh, manifested part and unmanifest part, I call it matter consciousness. What's those part in common is matter consciousness, which I, I define it as power to conceive, to perceive, and to be self-aware. It's absolute power, which can conceive, means it can create, it can perceive, means it can experience its creation. And it has inherent subjectivity, the self, self-aware. So that's the definition of matter consciousness. So this is the one you mentioned. So everything converge into the one. That one, I call it matter consciousness. Actually, matter consciousness can be further reduced to nothing. So the real source, real origin of everything is actually something called non-dual in Hindu tradition, in, in Buddhist tradition. They have a concept called non-dual. Uh, non-dual means there's no separation between object and subject. So there's no object-subject uh, separation. So in that condition, you can't describe it. Because if you want to describe something, you need to separate yourself with the object to be described. If there's no separation, non-dual, and you cannot describe it. Lao Tzu also said, if you can describe a Tao, that's not the Tao. If you can name it, that's not the name. You cannot even name it. You cannot even think about it because non-dual. You don't have a separation. You don't have an object to think about. That's the real source of everything. Now, do state you, you, because you cannot describe it and you, you cannot comprehend it. Therefore, you cannot talk about it. That means whatever you say about it is not correct. That's why we normally describe it negatively because we cannot see what it is. We can only see what it is not. Therefore, we use timeless, dimensionless, infinite, and those negative description. Uh, because I'm trying to build a model, I have to describe it somehow. That's why I call it matter consciousness, and I gave it a working definition. The working definition is the power to conceive, to perceive, and to be self-aware. This is the fundamental starting point of the model, 
the matter consciousness separate uh, itself into manifested matter consciousness and non-manifested consciousness. Once you have the binary, you can build the computer, i.e. you can use the binary to make the processor, you can compose data, and you can write the program with binary. In Lao Tzu's uh, term, it's called the, the Tao uh, gave birth to one, one gave birth to two, two gave birth to three, three gave birth to 10,000 things, which is everything. So in, in, the, in the beginning, it's actually uh, also compatible to Judeo Christian tradition. I mean, in, in, in creation story, God started with light, let there be light. And then he separated light from darkness. So you have light and you have darkness. Then you have a binary. And if you have a binary, you can start to manifest. Well, I understand that you also see the Platonic realm as having many levels. And I, I think the idea of going from three to the 10,000 things is there are many levels potentially in there that might entail deities or demigods or spirits of various types, angelic or demonic spirits who are manipulating the program. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, because we have a computer and we can program the computer to operate at a different clock speed. Therefore, uh, in this model, this computer operating at multiple clock speeds. Uh, at each clock speed, you produce a vibration frequency, and you produce a parallel universes. <coughs> so at each clock speed, you process a, a parallel universe. So there's many levels. However, it's not the turtle all the way. One of the reasons many people reject the simulation hypothesis is they can argue if this world is produced by computation by another world, and then that another world should be produced by another world, then it's turtle all the way down, there's no end. <laughs> Whereas in this model, it converges from multiplicity you actually converge into simplicity. At each level of the computation, you increase the memory, increase the capacity, increase the computation power. If you descend from the top of the parallel universe downwards, you diverge. It's called one over many. If you ascend from different parallel universe, you converge. So all the deities are actually ourselves. They are not somebody external. They are ourselves at a different level of reality in parallel universes. For example, um, many people can have a common existence in another level. Let's take a dog, for example. In the physical reality, you have poodles, and you have labradors, you have a pugs, and all those different species of dog can be converged into a dog. Dogness, at another level of the universe, you have a dogness, and the dog can also converge with other mammals to converge into mammal. And a mammal can converge into a single sentient being, for example. It converges into singularity eventually, which is a matter of consciousness. It's, it's not turtle all the way down, it's actually convergence into singularity. All women can converge into Eve, for example. All men can converge into atoms. Those are the archetypes at the different level of the universe. 
And uh, well, they, they, they are not somebody else. They are ourselves. Let's go back to some of the high strangeness phenomenon that you observed in, in China and, and elsewhere. Uh, for example, uh, the lady who was able to create apports of uh, various Chinese herbal medicines. How, how would you account for that, given the platonic computer model? I think the psychic uh, can be likened to hackers, computer hackers. Uh, I think uh, the reason they can produce high strangeness phenomena is that they can actually interact with the computer. And they are awakened at a different level of reality. At that different reality, they have access to the computer which produce this reality. It's like we are producing a virtual reality we call metaverse. And we have access to the computer which produce uh, the, the metaverse. Similarly, if you go another level up, and if you are awakened at that level, you can interact with the machine. And by interact the machine, you can change the data. You can change the program. And you can change how the machine operates temporarily. So it's, it's like hacking into the system. Then if you can change the data or the program, and anything can happen. So manifestation could be a teleportation, which means it's change of coordinates. And then they can just teleport into this location from another location. It can be also manipulate the data. So if you create a set of new data, and that data is manifested into physical objects. So that's how I would explain it. Well, in our previous interview, as I recall, you went into great length about a training technique used for young children in, throughout China. I think you mentioned maybe thousands of schools are teaching young children a step-by-step -step process whereby they create mental images uh, captured on uh, cell phones and, and on uh, cameras and uh, perhaps on, on film, what we would call photography. So, w would you say that particular training program that you described in such detail is an example of hacking into the platonic computer? Hacking is a word we can easily grasp. Basically, it's interaction uh, with the computation system. The, the, the training is basically to make their high being active through meditation, through visualization, they have another level of reality available to them. Once they have another level of being awakened, we all have potentially uh, another level or many levels. The, as, as I mentioned last time, it's like nested Russian dolls. When we descend from high level, we put on more data at another level, we, we may not be physical, but we add another layer of physical data. Then we become physical. But most times, we don't operate at other levels. We only confine ourselves into physical level. Therefore, we don't tune in other levels. Whereas for children, they actually naturally, uh, they are in that level already. They are awakened already. That's why it's so easy to train children, because they haven't blocked the, the higher being, like us. When we descend from higher level into this physical level, it's like wearing a VR goggle, which is our physical eye. Yeah, we're wearing this goggle, and we only perceive the physical reality. Whereas children, that goggle hasn't been fitted properly. Yeah, it's like they, they are still have leaks. They can still see 
higher level of reality. And that's why they can interact with that level easily. A photography is also something that bothered me、uh, many years. But with the computation hypothesis, it can be seen as an airdrop. If it's information system, the Polaroid film is basically a display of images, whereas that mind vision is another display.、Uh, nowadays, we can understand if you can get into the system, you can get into the protocol, and you can airdrop image from one cell phone to another cell phone. So similarly. If you can get those two displays in sync, and then you can airdrop、uh, one image to another display, I, I think this is how、uh, photography can be explained. In a way, it would make sense. The idea that when one attains higher consciousness, one has access to levels of Platonic reality, whereby one one can manipulate the programming of the platonic computer. But we see in parapsychology very often、uh, people with psychic gifts who are not necessarily spiritually or psychologically evolved,、uh, and yet they have these gifts. And I, I wonder if you ha- have thought about how how we can account for that. Well, you you don't have to have a spiritual tradition or education or training. Those are innate capability demonstrated by children. They don't have any training,、uh, but they can easily get into those states. So it, it does not have to have a, a spiritually、uh, trained people to do this. However, if you are spiritually trained, it's easier for you because. You understand there's other realities. If you are convinced there's other realities beyond the physical, and then you you tend to look for it. Otherwise, if you are purely materialist, you wouldn't go there. You you would be stopped by your own limiting beliefs. In other words, the mainstream science actually、uh, disencourage you, you think beyond that. That's why most people are confined with physical. They they don't even think. They don't even want to go there. Because it does seem to me, and I've known many talented psychics.、Uh, they're not all spiritually or ethically evolved, but the one thing they have in common, as I think about it, is they believe they can do this. They don't see that this is impossible. They understand this is something they can do, and then they do. Yeah, it can be quite simple, actually. Yeah, yeah. Our mind is the biggest prison, and because we don't believe it can happen, we don't even want to try it. Even elephant in a circus,、uh, when they are、uh, small, they are trained by by by、uh, putting a chain on them into a big steel pillar, and they, they tried, they tried, and they, they couldn't escape.、Uh, then their mind. Has this concept? If I'm chained, I cannot escape. When they are older,、uh, if you chain them on a bamboo stick, they wouldn't escape. Their mind already conditioned is not possible. They don't want to even try. I think we are sort of conditioned、uh, by our education, by materialist science, that、uh, many things are impossible. Then, therefore, we don't even try. In other words. Uh, access to the programming on the platonic computer could be accessible to any sentient being. Yeah, yeah, potentially, potentially. I like one of the words I think you coined,、uh, which is the、um, psychonautics. Is that word you coined? Yeah. Well, it was it was coined by. One of my mentors, Gene Houston,、uh, to my knowledge, is the first person who used that term. But I like it. I think we're experiencing today a whole generation of people I call psychonauts who are exploring what what you would call these levels of the Platonic realm. That's right. The, the reality beyond the physical 
is fascinating. We need those psychonauts actually to explore it for us, and they will make tremendous contribution to the awakening of a human being. I think the human being is moving towards multi-universe beings. Elon Musk is trying to help humanity become multi-planet beings by exploring Mars. Yeah, eventually we will colonize Mars. We become multi-planet beings. But actually, we can easily become multi-universe beings. By explore other levels of reality beyond the physical, those psychonauts will be instrumental <laughs> to help us to explore this and to at least to understand it. Not everyone is talented. I don't think everyone uh, can uh, actually explore it. You, you need some talents, but those psychonauts they can help us to do it. During the development of my model, I actually. Talk to the psychic people and listen to them attentively. I treat them as an expert witness. What they say, what they describe, what their realization is very important for me to develop the theory. I treat them with respect, as though they are actually experts. Like in in science, we treat. Scientists with respect because they have things we don't have. For example, the scientists can have microscope. We don't. They have instruments. They can explore realities which are not accessible to us. They have telescopes. They can look into outer space which we cannot see with our naked eyes. That's why we respect them.、Uh, whereas those. Psychic people, they also have instrument. The instrument is that third eye, which we don't have. So why can't we treat them as expert to listen to them and to learn from what they have learned? Throughout the, my, my journey, this is one of the realization I have. So. I, I I treat them with with respect. Whereas many researchers, because we are used to do science, sometimes we actually treat psychic people as、uh, as kind of、uh, how do I say it?、Uh, Research animals. Yeah, we treat them as a criminal suspect sometimes. <laughs> yeah, as though they are they are they are, they are fraud. We interrogate them. <laughs> Actually, we are used to interrogate nature. We, we we put nature into labs. It's 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 a form of interrogation. We put matters into high pressure,、uh, high temperature, and or or, or vacuum.、Uh, we create extreme conditions. It's like torturing.、Uh, so we get some results. And sometimes、uh, we tend to use the same method to do science research, and that's why some people get bad results sometimes. Because if you think they are fraud, they are actually going to produce fraud for you, so you can get away from them. They don't need to see you anymore. <laughs> Would、well, do you practice any of、uh, the disciplines? Or that you've learned from the psychics you've worked with? Well, I I have to admit I I try, but I'm not talented. First of all, I'm I'm not really a good meditator. <laughs> My mind、uh, is very active, and I cannot easily quiet my mind. I think if you need to. Ascend to different level. You need to stop running some programs. That's how you get into another level. Whereas、uh, I, I tried many times,、uh, many years, and、uh, try to quiet my mind. It, it's been challenged for me. So I see myself as a researcher rather than practitioner.、And、so I'm quite happy to to, to research to investigate.、Uh, but if you want me to. Practice those. I, I, I'm struggling. 
Well, Simon Dwan, I, you've done a magnificent job, in my opinion, of putting together this model of the platonic computer. I'm quite sure that many of the viewers on the New Thinking Aloud channel will find it uh, both inspirational and of practical utility. So I want to thank you for being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me again. Uh, before we finish, I would like to pay tribute to your channel, to the many guests you invited, uh, which I have learned a lot from them. Particularly, I want to pay tribute to one of my favorite. Uh, his name is Pierce Grimes. Pierre Grimes, yes. Grimes, Pierre Grimes, yeah. He's such a wise man. And he gave me a lot of confidence in Plato. I understand he even got a lineage ship. Uh, a master of leadership in Zen Buddhism. E even that, he still preferred potato. So uh, having watched uh, his interview, I realized I need to take Plato seriously. Plato is not an ordinary philosopher. He is actually enlightened yeah, from watching here. That's how I actually take Plato seriously and apply his principle into this model. If you have opportunity to speak to him and thank him for me. Well, I hope to be able to do that. Pierre is uh, well into his 90s, but he's still very active. And I know he would be delighted to learn that he's been an inspiration to you. And I'll admit, I hear from many other viewers uh, about uh, the inspiration they draw from Pierre Grimes, as do I. So. Once again, Simon, thank you so much for being with me. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.